had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Whew. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. So which one did you enjoy listening to more? Well, this isn't even close, right? It's obviously the second one, right? Because the first one sounded like it was delivered by a lifeless robot. And the second one sounded and felt like it was delivered by a real feeling human being. And so let's talk a little bit about the reasons why those sound so different. At the risk of insulting your intelligence, right? The first reason is the first one was delivered in a very monotone manner. Every single note had that same robotic articulation. It also was delivered on a very rigid timetable. The first one also was delivered one syllable at a time. And the first one also never breathed. There was no sense of when something started and when something ended. And what made the second rendition sound and feel so much more appealing? What made it sound more artistic? What made it sound like it was delivered by a living, breathing, feeling human being? Well, simply put, it had everything that the first rendition didn't have. It had a sense of flow that was natural. It had a sense of dynamics, right? Loudness and softness variations that matched the nature and flow of the words that were being spoken. It had a beginning and end that could be sensed, right? Mary had a little lamb, right? You can hear and feel the beginning and the end of that phrase. Its fleece was white as snow. Again, you can hear and feel the beginning and end of those phrases. You felt the breath in between those two phrases. You also felt that each syllable naturally flowed into the syllables, actually flowed from and to the syllable before it and into the, to the syllable after it. And then finally, each phrase was delivered in a totally coherent, integrated way that captured the unity of the idea. Mary had a little lamb. Oh, its fleece was white as snow. And finally, it had a rhythm. Even though I'm not speaking on a rigid timetable, it had a rhythm and a flow. But that rhythm and that flow were natural. They were not trying to force into a very rigid timetable like a computer or a robot would do. Got it? Now let's apply what we just talked about to a real world musical example. Something simple, box minuet in G. First, the unmusical phrasing version, the robot version. Let's see how it goes. By the way, I'm intentionally trying to play this badly, right? Here we go. What do you notice? Right? All fingers. One note at a time. Dynamically flat. No interesting waves of loud or soft. No interesting choice of articulations, right? In a phrase, unmusical. 
Now indulge me as I prepare to play an artistic version of that small set of notes we just heard played quite badly on purpose. Don't forget it was done on purpose. But before we do, let's make sure we understand a couple of really important lessons. First of all, technique and interpretation are inseparable. In other words, how you move your body is exactly how the music is going to sound and feel. And secondly, if you want to play like an artist, in this context, if you want to play with musical phrasing, you need to have a crystal clear musical intention in your mind's ear of how you want the music to sound and feel. One of the first things to keep in mind is the underlying rhythmic flow of the piece. And by the way, this applies to any kind of music, rock, jazz, blues, bossa nova, hip hop, whatever. There's an underlying rhythmic flow that makes each music tick. In this case, I'm going to suggest to you to minuet. So there's an underlying feeling of threeness. But I want to make something clear. That doesn't mean you think and count. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. No, what you want to do is feel a very relaxed sense of threeness. So it's going to be more like one, one. One, 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 one. And you see how I'm keeping time with my body motions rather than by keeping time digitally and discreetly by counting. Got it? Another consideration regarding musical phrasing is the general dynamic level. How loud and soft and thick or light of a texture do we want to bring when we perform this? And so for this piece, it's not rock and roll, right? We're not gonna be banging away. What we wanna do is realize that this would have been a very delicate dance delivered with a lot of sensitivity and understatement. So it's not going to be this. It's going to be something more like this. Got it? So now with this flowing, underlying rhythmic feel of threeness and a commitment to play this in kind of an understated, very delicate way, let's now see if we can shape each phrase dynamically, meaning loud and soft, and also in terms of the proper use of the different articulations, in this case, legato and staccato. So without turning this into a dissertation, let me just kind of sing out loud one possible interpretation. So let's find the notes. So, Time to close this video out with one ginormous takeaway. If you want to play with musical phrasing, if, if you want to play like an artist, your starting point needs to be a crystal clear intention of how you want the music to sound and feel in your musical mind. And so the next step, highly recommended next step, the best 32 minutes you'll ever spend in your musical life, I recommend you watch my video called Introduction to Musical Mind, which is going to go deep into the next level. 
of what musical mind means and its implications for how you study, practice, and perform music. Go do it. You'll be glad you did.